Welcome to our Holy Week service as we journey to the cross together. You know, in the midst of all these unique days that we're a part of, it's good to take these moments to kind of pause and stop and reflect and contemplate on the significance of this week. To shift the focus of our minds that are racing a mile a minute, worrying about things and, and thinking about tomorrow, to kind of take a pause and shift those thoughts and focus on Jesus, on His sacrifice for us, on His immense love that He freely gives to us. And so tonight we get an opportunity to do that. We get an opportunity to reflect together. We get an opportunity to think about the purpose of Jesus' ministry, the reason that He came to earth. Tonight is a night where we're going to focus and reflect and journey with Jesus to the cross, where we see his sacrifice for us that set us free from sin and death, a sacrifice and a journey that made us children of God. And so my hope and prayer is that wherever you're at tonight and whoever you're with, I pray that you would have a personal encounter with our Savior tonight, with his word, from his very lips, from his actions as we consider the gift of his life to each of us. As we continue, I want to bring our focus together as we prepare our minds and our hearts to encounter the Lord through his word and through song and invite you to take an opportunity to pray with me. I'm going to open us up in prayer and, and I invite you to close with me as I pray the Lord's prayer, as we pray the Lord's prayer together at the end. Let's bow our heads and, and humble our hearts before the Lord and pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this night, for this opportunity to be together. And even though we're apart and separated uh, by a screen, Lord, we know that, that you are bigger than those distances, Lord. And you desire to come near to us tonight through your word, to engage with us and commune with us as we hear from you, as we sing to you, as we reflect and contemplate on your immense and deep love for each one of us. And so I pray that you would speak to each one of us tonight, that you would be near and that you would draw us closer to you as we look back at this story that is more than just a story. It's in the fabric of our lives. And so, Lord, together we come before you and we pray this prayer in anticipation of what you're going to do, the way that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, uh, hey everyone, um, we're just so glad to be with you. Um, if you could just join with us, uh, we're going to worship the Lord together. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong Just is satisfied. 
perfect spotless righteousness the great unchangeable I am the king of glory and of grace born with himself I cannot die and my soul is precious with his blood my Savior and my God, with Christ my Savior and my God. Oh, and hallelujah, and hallelujah, we praise the one, the As we continue in our service tonight, we take our minds back to an invitation that was given to us at the beginning of this week. Uh, hopefully on Monday you received a, an email kind of detailing an opportunity as a family or a household uh, to look at the first part of this story that we're going to go through tonight in Mark chapters 14 and 15. And so in this study of Mark 14, as you were invited to read the first 31 verses and kind of process that uh, and uh, answer some questions that we provided, Hopefully you got a chance to catch a glimpse of what we're going to be experiencing tonight. You notice things like the plot to kill Jesus of the religious leaders and Pharisees who wanted to get rid of him. You saw and were in the home of Simon the leper when the woman approached Jesus and broke this jar of perfume and anointed him and how those that were seated around the table were wondering, what is the deal with this? And yet Jesus blessed her for this action. We were seeing and witness to Judas agreeing to betray Jesus and turn him over to the authorities. We were there at the final meal that Jesus had with his disciples as he establishes this new covenant of his body and his blood for us, for you, and for me. And so tonight we enter God's word again to, in a sense, complete this story of the last days of Jesus' life and ministry on earth. And so at this time, I'd invite you, if you have your Bibles, you can open up to Mark chapter 14 and follow along with us. And if you need to hit pause to go get your Bible or, or open it up on your phone, that's totally okay too. But I invite you to kind of just bask and reflect on these words as they're read to you, as we're captivated once again by this story, this age-old, timeless story to us. From Mark chapter 14, verses 32 through 42. They, being Jesus and his disciples, went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, this hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once more he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. 
they did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. From Mark chapter 14, 43 to 50. Just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. Then one of them, standing near, drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Am I leading a rebellion, said Jesus, that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you, teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then everyone deserted him and fled. From Mark 14, 53 through 65. They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, the elders, and the teachers of the law came together. Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they did not find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Then some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days will build another not made with hands. Yet even their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again the high priest asked him, are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses? he asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists, and said, Prophesy and the guards took him and beat him. Mark 14, 66 through 72. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You also were with that Nazarene Jesus, she said. But he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said, and went out into the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, This fellow is one of them. Again, he denied it. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. He began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. Immediately, the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. For Mark chapter 15, verses 1 through 15. Very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders and the teachers of the law and the whole Sanhedrin made their plans. So they bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate. You have said so, Jesus replied. The chief priests accused him of doing many things. So again, Pilate asked him, aren't you going to answer? See how many things they are accusing you of. But Jesus still made no reply. 
and Pilate was amazed. Now it was the custom at the festival to release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man named Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Asked Pilate, knowing it was out of self-interest that the chief priest had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. Why, what crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him! Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Mark 15, 16 through 20. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is, the praetorium and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again, they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. Mark 15, 21 through 32. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it, and they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From Mark 15, 33 to 41. <clears throat> At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes uh, to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James the Younger, and of Joseph, and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. From Mark 15, 42 through 47. It was preparation day that is, the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, 
he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph brought, bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. For many of us, this is a familiar story. It's a story you've heard before. You know the characters, you know the plot line, you imagine the scenes. And for many of us, it's a familiar story, but it's also a true story. This is the greatest story ever told. It's got all the essential elements that make up a masterpiece. This story is packed with action. It's loaded with suspense. It's filled with intrigue. This is the story of the most unbelievable covert operation in the history of the world, a thriller of a rescue mission where the God of the universe becomes human and saves humanity from themselves. This story is the greatest love story ever written, showcasing the immense affection that God has for you and for me, that he would literally give all of himself, that he would die a death like that, that, that he would experience all that pain and loss just so that you would not have to spend an eternity without him. Now, as with most stories, there's a level of emotional investment that's attached with a lot of, I mean, think of classic novels that you maybe enjoy reading, or maybe it's a book series or a movie or television show, and you become invested in the characters, right? I mean, you're connected with who they are. You're gripped by what they're experiencing as the plot and the story unfolds. And, and so it would be easy to say that one of the most frustrating things, and literally the worst thing that could happen in a story is when, when, the, when the hero or the main beloved character dies. I mean, think about it. How many nasty letters did E.B. White get after everyone's favorite spider, Charlotte, didn't make it home from the state fair? Or how painful it was for Star Wars fanatics when Luke Skywalker just inexplicably vanished into thin air. And we know how fans of Sherlock Holmes felt as Sir Arthur Conan Doyle had him killed off. The, the public outcry got so bad that Doyle was forced to bring Holmes back from the dead. We don't like it when the good guy or the hero dies. And as you've grown to know and love and appreciate the character, you feel the loss, right? Your emotions are rising up. The pain hits and you're like, oh, no way. Why? Typically in those cases, we tend to ask ourselves two questions that kind of quantify and explain our frustration and our emotions. We ask things like, was that really necessary? And we wonder, who is responsible? In hearing the story of Jesus' last days on earth, perhaps you found yourselves wondering and asking, was that really necessary? Who's responsible? I feel like this last question is one that we tend to ask and wonder a lot as human beings. When we see something wrong in the world or, or something that is unjust or unfair or something that upsets our perceived perfect idea of how life should go, we tend to kind of look around for the problem. Who is responsible? Someone or something must be to blame. I mean, for many of us, it's become too easy and too convenient to just simply pass the fault off to someone else. And it actually is downright humorous to think about or notice how often that you and I tend to do that. I know I do it way more often than I would think. And it's almost an automatic, right? It, if you received a bad grade on a test, what's the first thing that we tend to say? Well, the teacher didn't prepare us very well. Or they gave us the wrong notes. Or the test was too hard. We find ourselves saying things like that rather than, well, I just didn't take the time to study or prepare like I should have. This shows up in our work. This shows up in our family, in our friendships. It shows up in our relationship with God. We're so quick to justify ourselves and avoid personal responsibility because let's face it, it can be extremely difficult and challenging to kind of own up to something that you have done that created a problem or injustice. 
And for many of us, this began at a young age. If you had younger siblings or a cousin that was around your age, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Remember that time when you and your younger sibling were kind of roughhousing in the house and, and you threw that ball a little too high and a little too hard and it knocked mom's crystal bowl off the shelf and it shattered into hundreds of pieces? I mean, she was going to find out. And when she did, what was her natural reaction going to be, right? To, to solve the mystery of how this took place. And so maybe you can feel the weight of her stare as she's asking you how this happened. You, you sense that sinking feeling in your gut that makes you just want to be sick, right? Your, your mouth gets instantly dry. Your hands start to shake. You start to think of all the sure and painful consequences that you have coming to you that you rightly deserve because you're the one that threw the ball and you were told numerous times not to and you did it anyway. And maybe your eyes start to dart around the room and they settle on your younger sibling. How tempting is it to point? How often have you pointed? Shifting the gaze and the blame to someone undeserving. You see, for many of us, when we see injustice or when we see someone getting unfair blame or treatment, we tend to search out for the culprit, right? We, we blame the system. We blame the government. We blame our parents. We blame our coaches. We read of an innocent man, Jesus, the Son of God, being unfairly arrested being paraded through an unjust and illegal trial, being beaten, whipped, and humiliated, being nailed to a cross when he had done nothing wrong. And are we enraged? Are you furious? Are you calling out and shouting out, demanding to know who's responsible? Or maybe you find yourself stopping short of calling for accountability because perhaps at this point, some of you know. You kind of felt this coming. The places to point your finger or shift responsibility are quickly disappearing. And we hear the words in Matthew's gospel account completely differently as Jesus is on trial before Pontius Pilate. And, and Pilate asks, what shall I do then with Jesus who is called the Messiah? And they, the crowd, all answer, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. And all the people answered, his blood is on us and our children. It's your responsibility. His death is on you. How does that sit with you? Now, I can't see some of your reactions. And maybe your face isn't saying anything. Maybe deep down inside you're going, what? No. Isn't that taking a little too far? That sounds a bit too harsh. That's not me. I wasn't there. I had nothing to do with that. It's not my fault. I'm not to blame. I'm not responsible. But the hard reality that each of us needs to not only come to grips with, but to own, even tonight, is the reality that, is that if, if you have ever committed a sin, if you have ever disobeyed or rebelled against God, that action in and of itself speaks just as loudly as those in the crowd that day. The prophet Isaiah writes, But your iniquities, your sin have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. For your hands are stained with blood, your fingers with guilt, your lips have spoken falsely, and your tongue mutters wicked things. Who's responsible for what happened here? The finger pointing starts right here. It starts with me. It starts with you. It's us. All of us are responsible. And this brings us to our next question. Was this necessary? I mean, did this really have to play out this way? Did he really have to suffer and die like that? The beatings, the whips, the thorn crown, the nails, 
Wasn't there any other way? Jesus himself asked that same honest question in the garden as Judas and the soldiers left the city limits in search of him. He prayed, Father, if it is possible, Father, if there is any other way, but there was no other way. This was it. Ever since the first time humanity fell into sin, God knew that this was going to be what it was going to take. He knew that if he wanted to do something about our brokenness, it could not be left up to chance, and it could not be left up to us. It would only be through him doing something on our behalf. And here's the amazing part. He looked at the cost, and he didn't hesitate. This was the plan all along. This is what he knew had to be done. In order to bring us back from the deadly path of sin, all of this, every last bit of it, was absolutely necessary. The offense, the weight, the penalty of your sin and my sin was so great and so numerous that it required no less than all that God could offer. It required the full extent of what he could give and what he could pay, and he did. We hear the mocking words of the religious leaders spouting off on how Jesus couldn't save himself. And that's the point. Jesus wasn't on the cross to save himself. He was on the cross to save you. He didn't come down off the cross that day. He came out of the grave for you and for me. God willingly took the blame. He willingly took the responsibility. He took the fall, the fault, and the penalty, all of it, so that what you had coming to you, what you rightfully deserved, He took it all as His own so that you wouldn't have to. Again, the prophet Isaiah describes it this way. He writes, He, Jesus, was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows acquainted with deepest grief, we turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on Him the sins of us all. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush Him and cause Him grief. And because of His experience, my righteous servant, which is Jesus, will make it possible for many, that's you and me, to be counted righteous. For He will bear all their sins. Did you catch that? Not only did he take our sin, not only did he take our punishment and our guilt, but he gives us a new relationship with God. Before, we were counted as sinners and enemies of God. Now, we are called his friends. Before, we were separated from God because of our rebellious ways. Now, we have been brought close. Before, we were counted as dead because of our wickedness and guilt. And now, we are counted as forgiven and free children of God. The Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians that God made him, Jesus, who had no sin, to literally be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What kind of love is that? How amazing and how deep is that level of affection and devotion? That's true love. That's better than the best love story ever written. Even though we did not deserve, deserve this gift, God sent us His Son. Even before we thought we needed His help, God gave us Jesus. And even when we were still sinning, God forgave us. In Romans 5, the Apostle Paul again writes, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
That's the best and the purest kind of love because that's a love that's not blind. God could not and would not turn the other way when it came to our sin. He couldn't. He couldn't overlook it. And yet his great love for us compelled him to action, to do something about our sin in ways that we could never imagine or do for ourselves. His love went the distance. It literally took him to the cross. It went to the grave and back so that you and I could be woven into the fabric of his story of grace. And that's a story that never gets old. Let's pray. Lord God, your word to us is good and it's humbling. When we read this timeless classic, this story of the death of your son, we realize in much greater detail that we're way more connected to that than maybe we ever thought. That we are responsible. That our sin and our wickedness and our evil thoughts and behaviors are the reason he went to the cross. And yet that was a part of your plan. Part of your plan to save us and to bring us back and to make us right with you. And so, Lord, we, we are thankful for the cross. We are thankful for your son. We're thankful for your grace and your love to us that is beyond anything we can imagine and understand and comprehend. And so tonight, Lord, we just bask in the power and awesomeness of your word and your promises, knowing that they are for us. Remind us of that again tonight. In your son's name, amen. Well, if you could uh, join with us, uh, we're going to continue worshiping together. When I survey the
I hope you've been reminded once again tonight of the incredible love that God has for each one of you. Perhaps tonight you have grown in your appreciation and thankfulness for the lengths that God went to just to forgive you and save you. I encourage you tonight to spend some time processing this and thinking about this more. If you're with your family tonight, take some time after this service to talk about this, why this matters, why this is important, to pray with one another, to take this before the Lord, all of us, to thank Him for Jesus. I want to also invite you to tune back in. This story isn't done. There's still an empty tomb that awaits. And so I invite you to tune in on Sunday morning to celebrate Easter with us. We'll have a live stream at 1030. You can find that on our website or on YouTube. But I invite you to join in the celebration as we rejoice that there is more, that there is hope, that there is victory, that there is new life through Christ. Hear now this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.